This is Derek Gentle, pastor at First Baptist, and you are watching highlights from a previous service. You can worship with us live tonight at our lawn chair service at 6.30 p.m. in the lawn of the church. There will also be a car section for those who need to be a little more careful. In the event of bad weather, we will meet indoors. Due to time constraints, we now advance to another portion of a previous service.
This is Derek Gentle, pastor at First Baptist, and you are watching highlights from a previous service. You can worship with us live tonight at our lawn chair service at 6.30 p.m. in the lawn of the church. There will also be a car section for those who need to be a little more careful. In the event of bad weather, we will meet indoors. Due to time constraints, we now advance to another portion of a previous service.
you will, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6 and verse 66. We'll be reading through verse 69. John chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is my privilege today to bring the theme interpretation entitled, Disciple, Be One. <laughs> there seems to be a, a kind of an idea today, a conception, that discipleship is a premium upgrade for those who want to experience a little more, who want to serve a little more, you can upgrade from regular old Christianity to discipleship. But I would like to begin by saying discipleship is not a premium upgrade on regular Christianity for those who are willing to pay the price. The word Christian appears three times in the entire New Testament. The word disciple appears 29 times in the book of Acts. It appears 75 times in this Gospel of John from which we just read. And 72 times in Matthew, including in the Great Commission, where we are instructed by our Master to go into the entire world and make not Christians, but disciples. Now, I'm not denying the, that a disciple can deny. Nor am I denying the need for growth. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Nor am I denying that sometimes disciples can enter into a dissension, as in Acts chapter 6. But I am saying, discipleship is what Jesus calls us to be. Now, there was a colloquial use of the term in the days of Jesus. Both Jews and Gentiles who were students of various rabbinic, philosophic, or rhetorical schools became apprentices of a master. They traveled with their master. They listened to the teachings of their master. They observed the lifestyle of their master. They assisted the master in his work. And after their master passed from the scene, they carried forward his message. But with the coming of the Holy Spirit and the establishment of the New Testament church, discipleship came to carry a more specific and deeper meaning. Paul Powell wrote in his book, in the Christian sense then, a disciple is a person who has accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and is seeking to learn from, obey, and follow after him as the master of his life. We see here in John chapter 6 four marks of disciples. First of all, disciples stick to Jesus. There was a group that followed Jesus. They're kind of more fans than followers of Christ. It says in verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Now notice they're not called part of the multitude. They are disciples who walk with him no more. But they're more in this colloquial definition of disciple of the time. And the reason was is that Jesus makes radical claims that are just very hard to accept. In verse 60 it says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they had heard this, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? It's not hard to understand, it's hard to accept because Jesus' truth claims are so radical that either you must accept him and surrender to him as Lord or reject him altogether. 
For example, Jesus claims in this chapter to be the sole source of personal fulfillment. He says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who drinks of me shall never thirst. He says in verse 55, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. He claims to be the sole source of personal fulfillment. Jesus claims to have come down from heaven. Perhaps you have had a benevolence case in your study, not so long ago perhaps, making unusual claims like that. We have some interesting people who knock on our doors, don't we? But Jesus said it in those very words, verse 38, I have come down from heaven. Jesus claims a unique relationship with the Father. In verse 32, he refers to my Father. Now, he did not say our Father or the Father. What he is saying here is that he has a unique relationship with the Father. <laughs> when he says in verse 44, the Father who sent me, he is alluding to his pre-existence and to his special calling as the Son of Man. So these people hear this. They're not unlearned people. I mean, I know they're not from the, the uh, theological seminary down there in Jerusalem. But these are Jewish people who know their scriptures. Even if they are the people of Galilee. And they know exactly what the implications of his statements are. And here's what they're thinking. This guy sounds like David Koresh. If this guy's a Jim Jones, we better get out of here before he breaks out the purple Kool-Aid. That's, that's what they're thinking. It says it more exactly in verse 41. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know. I mean, how many times have we said to him, Hey, Jesus, how's your mama and them? <laughs> how is it when he says, I have come down from heaven? I mean, listen, he can't be all of that. Why, we've known him all his life. And Jesus turns to the twelve. And he says, you don't want to go away too, do you? In seasons when we are discouraged, when we are weary, when we have been long in the barren wilderness, when something begins to shine a little brighter than it ought to, that is the question we have to answer. Will ye also go away? In other words, will we stick? Yeah, perseverance is the inevitable result of the new birth. And we persevere because God preserves. But perseverance is also a command to obey. Disciples stick to Jesus. Disciples believe in Jesus. Verse 69 Peter speaks for the group and says, We have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, We have come to believe. Faith is the fruit of a process. Andrew and Peter had heard John the Baptist bear witness to Jesus. You remember this back in chapter 1. And so they decide to check it out. So they just start following Jesus. Almost stalking Jesus. Jesus turns around and he says politely, can I help you? And they've got to come up with an answer. He's, he said to them, what do you want, fellas? And they said, um, uh, I got it. where are you staying? And Jesus said, come and see. You recall that Philip found Nathaniel. And he gave him the good news. He said, we have found the Messiah. And they conversed a minute. And finally, Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And what did he say? Come and see. And you might recall that there were some ladies who went to the tomb on that first Easter. And the angel says, 
You are seeking Jesus who is crucified, but he is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. It's open for inspection. We're not hiding anything from you. We're not trying to drive you into anything or manipulate you into anything. Check it out. Get your questions asked and answered. Count the cost. Know if this is what you want. Evangelism often works in slow motion like that. But, you know, sometimes we read Matthew 4 and, and we see Jesus going down to the shoreline. We see him talking to Andrew and Peter. We see they drop their nets and follow him. And we read the story and we think, well, this is the first time Jesus, they've ever seen Jesus. It's just a super-duper miracle. Jesus did a Jedi mind trick on them. I am the one you've been looking for. Drop your nets and follow me. <laughs> Andrew, this is the one we've been looking for. Let's drop our nets and follow him. But no, that's not how it worked. <laughs> they had seen Jesus. They had checked it out. They had accepted his invitation to come and see and questions asked and answered, they responded in faith and commitment. There is the process of faith, hearing the gospel, and so many haven't yet even heard it. And understanding the gospel. And do you remember the first time you heard that verse you had heard 15 million times before in your life, but then you really heard it for the first time? And then there are believing the facts of the gospel. Yes, I believe that. And then there is feeling a need for the gospel, a personal need. Not the kind of need that says, well, this is good for a lot of folks. <laughs> but the personal need said, this is good for me. And then there is desiring the gospel. Yes, my questions have been asked and answered, and this is what I want. And then there is finally that willingness to respond to the gospel in repentance and faith. He says... We have come to believe and know. Faith produces a high degree of assurance. After all, what you believe determines how you perceive the world around you and perceive yourself, how you perceive God. What you really believe. Not what you say you believe or what you think you're supposed to believe, or someone else told you to believe, or what you wish you could believe, but what you really truly believe will determine how you act and react. Amen? I mean, imagine you won the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes, and some lawyer comes to your door with a certified letter and says that two weeks from Tuesday you're going to receive ten million dollars. Now, for the next two weeks, here you are. You're still living in the same pastorium with not enough hot water and not enough electrical outlets to keep all your devices charged. You're still driving the same car with the air conditioner that, that runs half the time and rattles all the time. But brothers and sisters, while you might be driving the same old car, you're wearing a brand new smile because you have heard good news and you believed it and it changed your outlook on everything, did it not? What you really believe. Disciples stick to Jesus. Disciples believe in Jesus. Disciples are in a relationship with Jesus. Jesus. Verse 68, Jesus had asked, you guys don't want to go away too, do you? And Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Now notice he did not say, to what shall we go? Or what do we do next? It's not a what question, it's a who question, to whom shall we go? Because discipleship is relational. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, it says, and it, it talks about the establishment of the apostles. Remember, every apostle is a disciple, but not every disciple is an apostle. And it says, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with 
him. Item number one on the job description for a disciple is to be with Jesus. They hung out with Jesus. I mean, they literally hung out with Jesus. You know that seafood restaurant in Kinneret where they sell the St. Peter's fish? You know the one southwest of the Sea of Galilee there. When they went to eat at that restaurant, oh, to have been in the next booth and to have overheard someone say these words to the creator of the universe, hey, Jesus, can you pass the trials? <laughs> Vaughn Parrish describes it this way. The Bible says he called his disciples to himself. And with him they were as he pulled off jaw-dropping miracles. They wiped their mouths with the crowd as Jesus fed multitudes with a joyful meal. Their ears were scandalized as Jesus tenderly responded to the woman with the issue of blood. They had front row seats as he fleshed out the kingdom of God, bending their ears with riveting stories. They slunk back in fright as demons drooled and foamed and gagged confessions of his lordship. They were there almost every moment, clueless as to what might come next. They were with him. Now, my son is here, but when he was little, he used to go see his friend Ash Jeter. Ash Jeter's dad's name is Chuck. He is a person of incredible personality. Very unique, lots of fun, lots of interesting gestures and things. And to make you understand, when we were doing a campaign uh, a year ago, and we were raising money for building program and for missions. We had Chuck, if you can bring the picture up now, as Charles Culpepper, soft drink concessionaire and inventor of Campaign 2016. You get the picture, right? Well, Micah would come home acting just like Chuck. Now, it wasn't that he took Chuck Jeter lessons while he was away for the weekend, hanging out with his friend Ash and being around Chuck Ash's dad. He didn't take Chuck Jeter lessons. He had just been around Chuck. And when he came home, we perceived that Micah had been with Chuck. <laughs> and when you hang out with Jesus, spend time with Jesus, enjoy the presence of Jesus, You'll come home acting like Jesus, too. <laughs> Disciples stick to Jesus. Disciples believe in Jesus. Disciples have a relationship with Jesus. And disciples draw from Jesus. Verse 53, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Jesus says in verse 55, My flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink, except no substitutes. Drawing from Jesus. He's not, you know, I mean, this language of eating flesh and drinking blood, well, I mean, we all here know he's referring to what he did, which we commemorate at the Lord's Supper as we think about the body and the blood of Jesus. We understand that he is talking about spiritual intake, right? I'm sure that if someone heard this for the first time, though, it, they might want to run for their safe place. But he's talking about spiritual intake drawing from Jesus what we need. It's, it comes down to the Christian disciplines right here. The Christian disciplines. This is where they come in. The things we remember from the disciples' cross or the nav wheel illustration. They include spending time alone with God in Bible study and prayer. Scripture memory and meditation in verse 63, Jesus says, The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. 
Did you feel that when I read those words? The words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. And we draw from the life and we draw from the spiritual power that is in the words of Jesus. And it transforms us. It includes nurturing Christian fellowship. Because we need examples, we need encouragement, we need an environment, and we need an accountability. It includes nurturing Christian fellowship. It includes reliance on the Holy Spirit for power and for guidance. The Spirit-filled life. Jesus says, the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The Spirit gives life. But the flesh, me, minus the supernatural work of God. The flesh, me, left according to my own resources. The flesh, me, with my own plan, working in my own power. The flesh, me, minus God, counts for nothing. And then practicing the presence of God. Because it is a relationship where every part of life is lived together in fellowship with Jesus, before Jesus, and unto Jesus. The disciples' life is a disciplined life. But the disciplines enable us to draw fulfillment, guidance, and power from Jesus Christ. So a disciple is someone who believes in Jesus, someone who has a relationship with Jesus, someone who sees every aspect of his life as being accountable to Jesus, someone who draws fulfillment from Jesus, someone who sticks with Jesus, and let me add, someone who sees the Great Commission as his mission. But before I quit, I want to talk just a minute with you about the irreplaceability, the irreplaceability of Jesus. Simon answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter is saying, Lord, you alone can meet our deepest needs. There is no substitute for you. There is no replacement for you. And if being a, a disciple is being a follower of Jesus Christ, then Jesus is both central and irreplaceable. Jesus is irreplaceable when I need to be forgiven and am tormented by guilt and shame. When we're confused and don't know what to do next, to whom can we go? When temptation is stronger than is you, where else can you go? When you are sleepless through long, dark nights, when your burdens are beyond your ability to bear, when the situation is hopeless and you are hoping against hope, to whom can you go? When you are suddenly alone and you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, to whom can you go? When you are despairing even of life, when you're on a hospital bed, and death is imminent. To whom can you go? Indeed, to whom else could you go? Sometimes in ministry, it is easy to lose the dynamic of discipleship. We think of discipleship as something we do for our church members. We get busy with this, busy with the busyness of ministry and lose the thrill of walking with Jesus ourselves. But by refocusing on our relationship with Jesus and reemphasizing the disciplines of Christian discipleship, we draw fresh power from Jesus and a new thrill of walking with Jesus. That's the way it works in real life. When you hang out with Jesus, all the places you will go, all the powers he will show, and his secrets you will know. Not just the things that to church we relate, not merely money in the offering plate, not superficial trappings from the religious state, but hanging out with Jesus. Seeing him in unexpected ways. Your thoughts read by his piercing gaze. Exposing subtle schemes which our mind plays when you hang out with Jesus. 
There is the insightful bolt that will jolt, the precision of his laser-straight path, the violence of his righteous wrath, if you dare to hang out with Jesus. Surprising words you will hear. Boiling up from your heart your deepest fear and unembarrassed your saddest tear when hanging out with Jesus. He will take you through the worst neighborhood. The internal stranger will be dreadfully understood. But the place he chooses is safer than you would when hanging out with Jesus.